All right, we've got our buddy Saeed Balki on today. If you don't know Saeed, he is one of the few people on earth who has bootstrapped a company to a unicorn status, a billion dollar company without ever taking outside money. The guy's a legend. He's in his 30s and he's done all this. What I liked about this episode is most people, we talked to a lot of guys who have made it, but they're kind of just like, you, you ask him, what would you do today? And they kind of just shrug like, I don't know, that's what worked for me back then, but good luck to you. And you're like, shit, all right, I got to figure this out myself. Saeed's the opposite. He didn't close the door behind him. He kind of just puts a ladder down and he's like, hey, here's three specific opportunities that I see. And what I liked about these opportunities is he's very specific. He says exactly what he would do. And actually that he's looked into doing some of these things. Uh, the second thing is that he, these are not like moonshot ideas. It's not like, oh, invent the next big AI thing. These are just ideas that will just work. Like if you do execute them well, they will work. And this is one of those episodes where I actually was like writing down what he was saying. I was like, oh, I should do that. I literally slacked Ben. I was like, at Ben, at Ben, call me when you're free. Call me. <laughs> I got to talk about some of these ideas. And by the way, at the end, we talk about money and we ask a little bit about what people's numbers are. You'll understand when we get to that part about what your number is. I want you guys to do me a favor. If you're listening on uh, your, your podcast app, go to our YouTube page. Obviously, you have to subscribe because that's the gentleman's agreement. You subscribe when you when, when we create valuable content for you. All we ask is just for a subscribe. But Tell us in the comment section what your number is. You'll understand when you get to that part. And also, you can view what other people's numbers are. So this will be like a little bit of a social experiment. Saeed, I don't know if you've seen this. Do you recognize this from the camp? I haven't seen Saeed since, uh, since Camp MFM. I don't know if you see this. Yep. Aquapana. So Sam, when we were at the camp... Um, First of all, microplastics, all the rage right now in rich guy circles. <laughs> and so people are like, oh, yeah, I had my gut tested. For, I, I, my microplastics are like off the charts. And they're, they're like, what? But you're so like, you're so conscious about it. And the person was like, yeah, I know. And I, I'm conscious about it. And I still have like a credit card in my belly of like plastic. <laughs> and uh, we were like, damn. And so then I noticed Joe Gebbia, the, the Airbnb guy. And we are all drinking water bottles, like Fiji water bottles. They had like a thousand Fijis. And I was like, dude, I'm living large. I'm, I, everywhere I look, I could just grab ice cold Fiji. But Fiji comes in plastic. And I noticed he's only drinking from his own bottle that I, he sourced from somewhere. I was like, does this man bring his own water on the trip? And he's like, and he doesn't say anything. Of course, he's not preaching to anybody. But I'm like, I noticed you're only drinking that. Like, is there something good about that? He's like, I just try to avoid you know, plastics and you know, everywhere. I was like. He only drinks glass water. I only drink glass water. <laughs> immediately, yeah. immediately went home, ordered it. And so since then, I've only been drinking this. And we uh, we have to do an intro, Sean. Yeah. So Sorry. Syed was on the, the podcast like six months ago. You were a hit. People loved you. Basically, the gist of the pod is you have this empire that you own that you've not raised money for. It mostly started as a WordPress blog called WP Beginner. And then you saw which WordPress plugins, among other types of businesses, were most popular. You bought them or invested in them. Now your empire is doing something like over 100 million. I think you were somewhat vague, but I think you said over 100 million in revenue, the whole thing. You own gas stations, I think. You own um, tons of real estate. So you're just a, uh, uh, you're, you kind of have your hands in everything. The title last time, the catchy title, which I thought was really cool. Saeed is one of the few, very few people on earth who is a bootstrapped billionaire, meaning uh, or has built a billion dollar company, sorry, as a bootstrap. So not taking external money um, and did it kind of slow and steady and in a really unique way where you you really uh, grew inside this WordPress ecosystem and WordPress turned out to be really big. Andrew Wilkinson came on and called this strategy the barnacle on the whale. So there's uh, you know a whale and it's a, it's a growing whale. And if you can be the right barnacle, you can actually just kind of grow with it. And you can ride that, you could surf that wave and actually build a large business yourself. And by um, the way, for the record, we have to protect Syed here. He never said billionaire, I think. I think we said that. So that's us. He, could, he, he doesn't have to deny or confirm it. I, I tend not to focus on the valuation. The, the goal is to keep building cool things that our users are loving um, and with the team that I enjoy working with and have a good time. And if you want Saeed's like backstory, you know, from we were talking about like when you were a kid, what you were doing in your teens to how you built this empire. Like we did that episode. So this one, we're going to do something different, which was just, we were like, Hey, come back on. You're like, well, I kind of told my story already, but we said, actually just come in and just hang out with us. Like we do a normal MFM where we're, we're going to talk about five different things. It'd be great to have you here just to talk about those, whatever random things that come up 
uh, along the way. So if you want the backstory, go there. If you want to hang out, come here. So Syed, where, where you made this amazing document. You have a, another topic on here that I know that's just going to get uh, that's going to it's going to make Sean just super horny because he's going to be able to promote his own thing. Uh, uh, what, what do you have here? About hold on, this let me get warmed up while you do this. Go ahead. I'll stretch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I see, you know, there's, there's a massive opportunity in, in productized services uh, with, with the offshore market, um, especially in industries where the TAM is really, really high. Uh, I believe. This is greatly underestimated. Everybody's trying to go build this massive, big idea business and spending years and years building software, um, which may or may not work. Or if, if you're good at sales and you have some sort of audience, taking this model and going to town works. As a matter of fact, I was evaluating a business earlier today that just came to my table that, that's doing productized services. All right, everyone, a quick break to tell you about HubSpot. And this one's really easy for me to talk about because I'm gonna show you a real life example. So I've got this company called Hampton, joinhampton.com. It's a community for founders doing between 2 million all the way up to like $250 million a year in revenue. And one of the ways that we've grown is we've created these cool surveys. And so we have a lot of founders who have high net worths and we'll ask them all types of questions that people typically are embarrassed to ask, but provide a lot of value. So things like how much the founders pay themselves each month, how much money they're spending each month, what their payroll looks like, if they're optimistic about the next year and their business, all these questions that people are afraid to ask, but well, we ask them anyway, and they tell us in this anonymous survey. And so what we do is we created a landing page using HubSpot's landing page tool. And it basically has a landing page that says, here's all the questions we asked. Give us your email if you want to access it. And then I shared this page on Twitter. And we were able to get thousands of people who gave us their email and told us they want this survey. And I could see, did they come from social media? I can see, did they come from Twitter, from LinkedIn, it, basically everywhere else that they could possibly come from? I'm able to track all of that. And then I'm able to see over the next handful of weeks, how many of those people actually signed up and became a member of Hampton. In other words, I can see how much revenue came from this survey, how much revenue came from each traffic source, things like that. But the best part is I can see how much revenue came from it. And a lot of times it takes a ton of work to make that happen. HubSpot made that super, super easy. If you're interested in doing this, you can check it out, hubspot.com. The link's in the description. And I'll also put the link to the survey that I did so you can actually see the landing page and how it worked and everything like that. I'm just going to do that call to action then. And it's free. Check it out in the description. All right, now back to MFM. What's an example? Yeah, give an example. Because I don't think most people know productized service, offshore market, that's a lot of words. Sure, sure. So look, we took an investment stake in a company called Seahawk Media. Uh, and they offer custom WordPress development, website maintenance, basically other webmaster related services at affordable prices. And we can also do it white label. So this is like, if you're a small business and you can't afford to hire a full-time developer, you can go here, you know, basically get a developer for hire kind of thing at very, very low rates because the team is based out of in India. Um, and, you know, there's a white label offer there as well. So other agencies, web hosting companies, businesses can add like add on revenue, uh, you know, by reselling Seahawk. But other example could be take like very large market, like bookkeeping, right? There's this company called Bench. I use them. Yeah, they charge you between like $299 or $499 and then more, right, per month to do your bookkeeping. And they're really, really slow. Um, one of our portfolio companies were using it and super annoyed. And we brought this thing in house. Um, but I know that many accounting firms now have offices in Pakistan, India, Latam, et cetera, uh, where they're doing this fractional CFOing tasks, like very, very basic tasks, like bookkeeping and basic PL um, at super low cost. So someone can go in and say, hey, we will do the bookkeeping for you uh, at this rate. Uh, I know, of course, like, Shepherd, right? This is this is one of the companies oh, tell you can me more go about and. Them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that th there's there's a large opportunity here where you take a market where TAM is really high, especially a services market, and then you turn it into a productized service. You uh, offshore the talent, and then you add like a reseller or a white label model. I think the uh, the one that I, I was looking at was bookkeeping, and I think. The TAM there is so, so large. And the key is 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 the reseller and white labeling model, um, which is what we learn from Seahawk Media. So let's let's talk about Seahawk, right? Because you have a tactical example here. So Seahawk is basically you outsource WordPress development agency. And how much does it cost, roughly? Let's say it costs like $1,000 to build a website. I'm just making this up. Um, and you, you're a web hosting company and a bunch of your clients are coming to you and saying, hey, I want you to maintain my website. And you're like, well, we just do hosting. I don't want to build a services department. 
So they will go to Seahawk, partner with Seahawk and say, hey, can you manage these clients for me? And we do a rough split. Um, so now there are many web hosting companies that are effectively white labeling Seahawk Media's team um, and offering add-on services to their customers, like custom website design, um, maintenance by the hour, you know, site optimization, hack site repair, all sorts of these services um, have been productized and delivered without you ever building your own team. So in that in that same way, by the way, this is something that we're going to do on, on WP Beginner. I know the team is working on it and it's going to go live is we will start offering professional websites. So anybody who comes to WP Beginner um, can get a website done and so on. But you can do the same exact thing in every space. So let's say bookkeeping. I can go to all the smaller CPA firms that don't have the economics oh. to build on their own bookkeeping and just say, why don't you just white label my services? And this is like, you know, now Joe's CPA bookkeeping. Right, uh, all, right. You're getting all the clients. You charge whatever markup you want. Um, you're paying me X. Uh, so on the back end, it still works the same way. So if you're like, for example, Shepard uh, can, can like, instead of doing a traditional affiliate model, you can do this white label model where other people are, or just becomes like your lead I source. have a question for both of you guys, Sean with Shepard and Syed. I, I'm sure you you know a bit about this as well. When you guys are out, so I think, uh, Sean, you guys have people in Latin America. I think you also have people in Asia. Yeah. Uh, when you are going out, and I don't know how many people you guys have, but let's just say hundreds. When you're going out and you're like finding these people, how hard is it to find them? How hard is it to train them? And how hard is it to keep the quality high? Um, I mean, it's the main thing, right? If you don't provide quality talent, or if you're not able to provide higher quality talent than somebody could just easily search for, then you don't really have a business. So for example, with Shepard, they have 100 recruiters. Like I remember when I was doing the investment, I was like, hey, what's this like giant payroll thing? I thought there's like nobody here. Like what's, what are these 100 people? Who are these 100 people? Where, where's your office? He's like, we have an office in the Philippines, we have an office in LATAM. And what's in that office is just recruiters who are constantly searching for talent and then basically testing them, filtering them and trying to, because you're like, the whole game is people want to hire overseas. They want the cost savings. But what you don't want is the average person in the Philippines or the average developer in LATAM. You want the top 1%, the top 5%. And so who's going to do that filtering? And that's the that is the whole service of what Shepard does is goes to find that. So to, in order to do that, is it hard? I don't know if I would say it's like, it's not like rocket science, but it did take somebody on the ground in the Philippines who started an office, has 100 recruiters there, and then they have a whole system and process how they intake talent. And so they're getting thousands of resumes and then they're trying to filter down, okay, when somebody comes to us asking for a designer or a bookkeeper, how do we give them the best and not the average person? So you do want to have that. So that's the like, that what Saeed's saying is you've already built that hard infrastructure. Now you could go to Joe, the CPA, and say, you need a bookkeeper. Well, I actually already have the good bookkeepers here. Um, you already have a customer relationship. Why don't you create an add-on service? It's extra revenue for you without extra work. That's really smart. Right. Yeah. Uh, and for, you know, same uh, to echo Sean's point, quality is very, very important. <laughs> if you can't deliver quality, it doesn't work. But the good thing over the years that we're seeing is that talent across the world is getting better. So if, if you go 10 years ago and you're trying to hire uh, overseas, whether it's Philippines, India, you may not have had that same level of talent. But the new generation, uh, much better English, uh, you know, more technolo technologically adept and so on. So when we're hiring in Seahawk, for example, this, this is, you know, super better talent. We know they can build WordPress website. Or so that, you know, if you're a business owner, you're like, how do I know when I go to Upwork that this person actually knows what they're doing because anybody can go make a profile on Upwork. There's right. not a lot of vetting being done. Here, you know that this is a vetted person who can do it. And it's in Seahawks' best interest to vet that person because if that person is working on uh, a client's website for some big hosting company, you're not just going to lose that one client. You you might lose the contract right. of white labeling the service for that big hosting company. And so are you excited? Are you going to start this for accounting up the productized service of accounting or uh, bookkeeping? No, I'm not. I'm I'm not actively uh, looking to start it, but I'm studying it um, right now. And I talked with one of the influencers in in the accounting space uh, to see what if there's a JV potential. I bet that guy's just a thrill to be around. 
<laughs> accounting influencers. Yeah. It's like, ooh, he's got his he's got his top button on button. Do you like to party? <laughs> like but that guy's just a thrill. <laughs> so you have another one here, which is ecosystems. And this is the kind of barnacle on the whale idea that we were talking about earlier. Yep. So you were like, you, here's what you wrote. You go, I'll be the first to admit I've benefited tremendously off WordPress and the growth of WordPress. And I'm grateful for that. Andrew has talked about how he, with WeCommerce, benefited from the growth of Shopify. He got in early, started making Shopify themes. And then as Shopify grew, his themes business grew. And then they bought more Shopify apps. And you said, there's got to be more of these, basically. that this there's, there's not just those two. There are more. So what are some other ecosystems that you see that you think are exciting? Uh, the one that I'm excited about is uh, QuickBooks and the Zero apps. So these accounting uh, platforms are very, very sticky. I missed the deal here. It was a really, really good business. Um, they were doing like $3 million in revenue, extremely profitable. Uh, and I, I believe there's a lot of value in someone acquiring multiple one of these uh, QuickBooks apps or Zero apps, or maybe QuickBooks apps, and then you port it over Zero right. <laughs> and, and so on. Uh, and, then, and then you cross sell. So it doesn't matter if the user switched from QuickBooks to Zero or, or vice versa, you're still keeping that customer. Um, you can even multiply that effect by going and tying multiple ecosystems. So you can say uh, QuickBooks and Shopify or QuickBooks and WordPress and, and, and so on. I think there there's uh, serious potential here uh, when, when you're looking at these businesses. Dude, this episode, I know this episode is good because <laughs> Saeed is saying ideas and I'm literally like, Opening up an email thread, being like, we got to do this. We got to do this right now. And <laughs> like, it looks like I'm sitting, I'm almost like on my toes up, ready to like go sprint because I like, he's saying things that immediately I could see the opportunity. This, this is good. Sean, do you know how many users, uh, this is shocking. Do you know how many users or how many customers QuickBooks has? I would guess like 2 million. I would just guess a crazy number. Syed, do you know? Go ahead. I believe 30. Yeah. I think it's 30 million people. Wow. 30 million, <laughs> 30 million customers QuickBooks have, which is insane. What does Zero have? It, it's, it's smaller, but it's, it's in the millions as well. Am um, I right? Is, is it about 30 or is it even more? I, my number could be old. I, th I think you're, 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 you're spot on there. And what do you think is the play? Is it software plugins or is it agencies that manage service? I think the the software play, the one that I was looking at was software play. And I, I've seen like other software plays in this, not the, the one that I really wanted, I missed it. It's so stupid. Um, I can see the but, regret in your face. Dude. I, I've never <laughs> seen you have like FOMO. This is amazing. But like, you know, there, there, there are other, you know, implementation partners um, are around these that have built adjacent apps uh, that you can go in and then use that as distribution. This is a very essential tool. Like you're not going to not get rid of it. So he's had two great loves of his life, his wife, and then whatever this app is that got away. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't think so. He'll never think, stop yeah, thinking yeah. about this app. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm studying the ecosystem. Um, and I think this ecosystem, you can find like wonderful businesses that they're not going to be venture growth, right? They're, they're not going to have venture growth, but they're going to be extremely profitable. And you know that people are going to keep using uh, QuickBooks or Zero because they, as long as they have a business. Okay, so I'm uh, what you're talking about is the QuickBooks. I just googled QuickBooks plugins. So you're just talking yeah. about something like that. So there's like um, that's right. There's a, a a variety of plugins that you can buy. I imagine they cost money. Um, yes. How much uh, are are you the biggest WordPress uh, plugin business on WordPress? I think collectively, when you look at it, um, after automatic, it, we would be the the biggest. Who? Okay. Can, I, and I, I we promised that we're not going to dive deep on numbers. Can you say like the second or third place? Like, what? How big of a business would they have? Also, tens of millions of dollars. Yeah. Um, and so, how big of a business do you think you could build just on the QuickBooks uh, platform or the QuickBooks ecosystem? I think if you look at the App Store, because you know, just like Shopify has an App Store, QuickBooks have an App Store, um, and if you take a couple of apps that might be doing. Three million, four million, two million dollars in in that range, and you exit by five, and you buy five of those two million, doing two million. You just built a ten million dollar ARR business that may not be cross selling enough, so you can unlock uh, more value. They might be mismanaged gems, 
Uh, by the way, if someone wants to do it, reach out to me. I would like to invest in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm studying this. And if you have a, if you're listening and you have a QuickBooks app, <laughs> yeah. Sean at how, how? I'll forward you to say you. Don't worry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're gonna be like the mafia. Like, where's my cut, bitch? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> There's no direct access here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What a uh, what um. So like when you do, I imagine that there's a so, so there's software like Jungle Scout, I think, for or there's a bunch for Amazon where you could see which services or products are selling the highest. I imagine there's the same for Shopify. When you're studying QuickBooks, I can't imagine that that software exists. What does studying mean? I think you're you're looking at the number of reviews that the, a specific app has. You know all all the signals that, that they might be featuring something that's in the popular. Um, looking at what's in the new. You can Google or search in in the QuickBooks like a category, uh, you know the tags they're using, and see how many uh, solutions show up in that, and then gauge by okay, if only three or four percent of users are going to leave a review, that's probably how many re- users that they actually have. So if somebody has like hundred reviews, they, that's only four percent of their user base potentially. Um, so you can you can sort of make a hypothesis there and say okay, this category or this keyword. Uh, maybe it's receipt management or whatever it maybe um, has twenty apps, and that's that's how big the market size is for a receipt app in QuickBooks. If that Dude, makes you're sense. gonna you're you're basically a billionaire building these like plugins, basically, and I think that that's I mean that's that's awesome. Like that's just so funny because the people listening to this, you guys should actually go to the YouTube because you're smiling as if it's like too good to be true. You're like, no one's talking about this. I can't believe why is no one talking about this? Like that's kind of the vibe I'm getting from your facial expressions. I enjoy the game of business and I enjoy <laughs> find, finding these opportunities that allows uh, us to compound. And, and that's what's exciting. Dude, anytime I hear a billionaire talking about where he's founding <laughs> compounding, I'm like, talk dirty to me, baby. Yeah, like, <laughs> like you're fine. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, you, you keep saying billionaire, which, which, is, which is not uh, By angry. the way, <laughs> it, it, I'm completely making that up. I want to uh, I want to respect that. I am I was being uh, hyperbolic there. It's a state of mind, baby. It's a state of mind. It's not a, no, yeah, it's a state of mind. So, um, yeah, let's do open source because I was reading today uh, Y Combinator put out a like request for startups. They like kind of update this once a year. And one of the things, uh, one of the top requests that they had was more for-profit open source companies. And they were like, we funded GitLab and they, they named like five. They, we, fund, we funded 150 of these and we want to do more. Like we like this model. This is a good model. And I was reading it and I was like, I think I like, I know what it is. But I don't know why it's in, why it's like particularly interesting or why it's unique and special. And so, tell us about the open source stuff. What what is intriguing to you about open source? I believe that open source is one of the most powerful ideas of our generation because it gives you many freedoms. So anyone from anywhere in the world can look at the code and learn from it. Imagine like you know having some of the best programmers in the world writing code, and then you, some new kid. Um, in India or Pakistan or where, US, wherever you are, be able to read that code. And then when you see something that maybe there's an idea that you have, you want to contribute back to it, you can just write a patch and commit that patch. And then the project maintainers can say, okay, this is great. Um, they can adapt your code. And all of a sudden, your code is now being used on millions of websites. Can you explain? Because this is a kind of counterintuitive idea, right? Like normal business would be, it's our product. We hire people. They build the product. We would never want others to see our secret sauce, our code, or be able to use it or fork it, which means it's basically remix it for themselves. And so, like, I, I, do, I don't know. Is there anything interesting about the origins of this? Like, when it came out, was this a controversial idea? Because it to me, it's pretty anti the way you would normally build a business. Can you paint that picture kind of from first principles? And, and why would anyone want to contribute? So, so, well, one, it's this very, very controversial in the beginning, right? It was copy left. You have copyright, and this is copy left. Like, hey, everything we're building is for the good of society, for progressing technology, for innovation. Um, so there's a lot of people that get behind that vision. The freedoms that it offers um, in, in countries, like a lot of people can't afford some of the more expensive enterprise software. offer. Maybe they're in, in Pakistan, or maybe they're in Africa somewhere, where they don't have the resources to have those kind of tools to build their business. And now you have this open source platform. Let's say WordPress. It gives you the freedom to publish anywhere. Maybe there's censorship happening on, on, on 
any other social media platform or publishing platform. And you can self-host your own WordPress site and you know put your take out there. So that vision uh, you know, becomes really, really important. I think when you look at long term, anybody can write code. You can hire developers anywhere. So it, most markets will get competitive and your vision becomes a USP. Okay. And and that's what open source brings to to the table, and it, it's going to disrupt basically every established market that exists. And um, there are uh, startups that are coming out. Uh, I, I was I was looking at this guy. I talked to this guy named Joseph. He runs OSS Capital, and he's deep into the open source community. He's looking at you know various GitHub projects, uh, and he he has a pretty cool method, right? He sorts them by the number of stars. So that means how many developers are really liking that code. Um, and then he gets behind them. So one of the things that he invested in was AppFlowy, which is a Notion a competitor, but open source and affordable. So now I can make my own Notion and use it. Maybe I can self-host it uh, and significantly reduce costs in my business. Let's do some examples. So there's Windows, the operating system. Then you had Linux, the, the open sourced counterpart. And Linux is like a, what, like 20 billion or something like that. It's like a big, right. very big, like kind of uh, enterprise. And they make their money off just the services, right? Because the product is free. That's kind of the whole point of open sources. You could just use a self-hosted for free. But if you want the like, is that all that they do with Red Hat? Is is it just services that generates so much revenue? Services, add-ons, uh, you know, pre- premium versions of that. So like Nginx, for example, there's a free version of Nginx and then there's the pro version of Nginx, which gives you a lot more features, et cetera. Right. Um, to save you time and convenience. Same thing in WordPress. The core of WordPress is free and does many, many things. And there's then there's plugins. And many of the plugins are free, which gives you a lot of cool things. But then if you want more convenience, you pay for right. um, additional updates and support. So you have WordPress, which is the free you know, open source publisher. I don't even know what the closed source version of, of WordPress is. Maybe it's just social media. Um, but then you have like uh, Android, open source, iOS, the, the Apple you know operating system, closed source. So there's always this kind of like, dual winner and um and so people have this strategy of just like x but open source like slack but open source notion but open source is that generally like a good um like i, I like blueprints when it comes to business um, right. some, somebody told me about a blueprint they were like just superhuman for x the way superhuman just took one piece of work software and was like pay 20 bucks a month but i'm gonna make it like really slick and like incredible ux and just way better design and like uh, linear was a good example of that Linear was basically superhuman for Jira for the ticketing system, and it worked. It's like a very successful company. Is a blue is a successful blueprint in your mind like popular thing, but open source? Does that work? Absolutely. I think you take something that has a large TAM, uh, and then you make an open source version out of it that is cost effective, affordable, and now you grow with the community over long term. Like I don't think anybody could build what WordPress did as a proprietary software, but the reason why WordPress it was so successful was because all the other website building platforms uh, or all the other hosting companies, as you say, that didn't want to have their own website builder, they started contributing to it. So GoDaddy, instead of building their own website builder, I mean, they have one, but they went in WordPress and started contributing to WordPress hmm. uh, and, and, and many other hosting companies did too. So Shopify, which is essentially a hosting company, uh, same thing with Wix, at the core of it, they're hosting. Um, they have their own proprietary platforms versus WordPress is built by and built on top of by many, many, many other hosting companies. And the sheer number of contributors are a lot. And you you see the same thing um, in, in Chrome as well and, and others. But can't you say that, okay, so WordPress powers how much? 35% of the internet? Probably a little more, like 40%. Okay, so forty percent. Okay, so Shopify has a today they're at worth a hundred billion dollars. I don't know right. what WordPress is worth. I don't know what their revenue is because they're a privately held company. But for controlling thirty or forty percent of the internet, you you should be making many tens of billions of dollars a year in revenue. Do you think that WordPress has over a billion in revenue? I would think no. So I think when you think about WordPress, WordPress is a community project, and there is a uh, proprietary company that the founder of WordPress, uh, Matt Mullen, like started called Automatic. Automatic has good size revenues. They're a private company, so I don't know what what those revenues are. Um, but I, I, it would be fair to say that it's not as high as as Shopify. But when you look at the collective ecosystem of WordPress and all the companies that are in it, um, you take GoDaddy. How big is GoDaddy? You take many, many, many other hosting companies or WP Engine and so on, and you put collectively together. I would say that the 
market cap will be bigger. Yeah. Auto- so automatic was valued at three billion, and it was valued at seven billion at some point in its private. Uh, these are I don't know if this is rumors or confirmed, but it's like published in a bunch of different places, and so that's what the automatic is kind of the the uh, the company that like kind of I don't what would you call it? the steward of the open source program or the open source project I'm not sure what you would call it they're essentially the red hat what red hat was for linux automatic is that for wordpress right they have the same founders yes yeah and plus sam you you get all the developer street cred bro like i mean matt mullen like that guy's right he he's a made man he's untouchable there's no doubt that it's awesome i think yeah. actually when i think of like internet heroes i think matt mullenwag is 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 up there i actually used wordpress so check this out let me explain the difference in business models i used wordpress for the hustle the hustle ended up being worth tens of millions of dollars it reaches hundreds of millions of people uh and we are small compared to many of the others on wordpress you know so i know i had a friend that had a wordpress site that was doing 100 million monthly uniques um and so there's no doubt that it's the best but look, check this out I bought WordPress's software called uh, WooCommerce. WooCommerce was uh, $300 a year. I had a business on there that was doing $5 million a year in recurring revenue, and I paid them $300 every single year. If this were Shopify or something else, I would have been paying them, I believe, 50, 000, I think, is it 10% or 5%? So I'd have been paying them 25 to 50 grand a year. And I was like, this is a fucking steal. I'm stealing from these guys. And I, I was like, I don't understand this business. I'm getting all of the value and they're getting virtually none. Well, well, I think the value is disproportionately favored in, in, in for the consumer. And that's what you want in a business, right? You want your users to have disproportional value uh, coming from you. And I think like if when you look at products, and this happens when you're studying long-term when your product can't be 10x better in a specific space, uh, it, it it really becomes all about the brand uh, and the value that you're delivering when customers aren't using your product like actively. So having that value being so disproportional m- makes your business far more stickier uh, than your competitor who might be charging an arm and a leg. I have a bad idea for you, Saeed. So... Where where else have we seen this where, the, oh, the customer is just getting an incredible deal. Uh, one idea that comes to mind is Costco. And Costco is basically like, hey, we'll sell you the goods at cost plus 10%. And that, that's just going to cover the kind of the carrying cost of putting these items on the shelf. So like if whatever that bag of rice actually costs, it's that plus 10%. That's, the, that's always the price. And we're going to negotiate the shit out of these vendors, by the way, to get the lowest possible version of that price. And we're going to use our scale to do that. And all you got to do is pay us $120 a year. It's like $120. I'm saving that in one grocery trip, two grocery trips. This is a no brainer. And they've built a like, you know, huge subscription business off this. Do you think somebody could do that in the software world? Because I've, I've seen a, a couple examples of this where I bought this um, screenshotting tool that's really good. It's called Cleanshot X. And uh, free, free shout out for those guys. They, uh, th- so it's really good like screenshot tool. But one of the ways you can buy it is off some some service that like, it's like it has all the random software tools put there on the shelf, like a, like a Costco or like an Amazon for random software tools. And it's usually at a lower price than if you go buy direct than on the site. And I think it's if you have a, if you have a membership to the overall thing, then you can just get these tools for free. I kind of wonder if somebody could do this with the open source community and just say, all right, pay us thousand dollars a year and then you're going to get, you know, WooCommerce, you're going to get all these things at the lowest possible price. So you're just going to get go, go round up all of the software and say, hey, you're going to be selling at cost plus 10%. And we're going to have this, uh, um, uh, you know, the subscription revenue to for our members who, who want to shop there. Is that a, how bad? How bad on a scale of one to terrible? What, where is that idea? Two-sided marketplaces are generally a tough business to to build. So Look how there, nice there are is. challenges in you know, there are challenges in, in, in the model, but uh, but you know you, you can you can try it, and I think there there are companies doing it. I think if you focus it on as maybe a sub subset, let's say um, agencies, and you say, hey, development agencies, we can get you access to these softwares uh, at a lower price. Probably that's where I would start, and then you try to make it broader. Versus saying we have every software under the sun. Um, because you have to do some backend integration of SDKs. A lot of indie softwares don't have the ability to have reseller models and versus like, hey, here's here's my thing. Take the payment, give me money in the backend. That's generally not how software provisioning works. So that there's uh, right. a little bit more nuance there than what Costco has. So what is this OSS Capital doing? They basically 
you said they go through okay. GitHub projects and they look at like which things have like some combination of engaged users, large TAM, and what do they do? They invest in them or they add, they build yeah. products for them? They're, they're investing in them. Um, and and <laughs> I think like they're investing in the open source yeah. community. He's like, what? They just give them hugs and shit. What? Where's the <laughs> yeah. money of this whole business? Wait, yeah. What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> they invested five high fives. <laughs> no, I, no, actually, they're they're, they're investing um, capital in in those businesses and helping them come into market. Like, I mean, if you look at GitLab, for example, it's like eleven billion dollar market cap right now. So, like, AppFlowy going after the Notion market, uh, or, or like Cal.com going after the scheduling market. I think we're going to see many of these established uh, companies that might be unicorns right now in the project management spaces and such get disrupted by an open source solution. Uh, and then what's going to happen is like you and I can take AppFlowy and say, we're making Notion for doctors, and we can take the code, fork it make it better, and then contribute back to it because mm -hmm. the way the licensing is done. So there will be flavors of these open source softwares that, that will get created. Like there are flavors of WordPress that are created. Um, and that's what makes it so disruptive uh, because like a doctor who might be using Notion will say, well, actually, I want to go use this tool because it's, it does like the extra 5% that Notion won't do. Well, which categories and products do you think you think this model would work for? Where you're like, you see a particular product category, you say, if we if we did if we attacked that category with this open source blueprint or framework, I think that could be a winning combination. I think uh, the open source CRM that that, that, that does a well <laughs> good enough job will will be will be quite disruptive. Um, and, and, Perfect and the segue to our sponsor. Play the ad, <laughs> baby. That... <laughs> but but I think uh, you 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 take you take any you know large uh, TAM market and, and, and software. And you add open source component but to it. Like Sam Dito, Stability AI. They're basically open AI, but open source. They're the ones who make stable diffusion. Right. How so big like, are they? I mean, they're multi-billion already. But it's like AI hype cycle, they're they're very big, right? But but people actually use, you know, stable diffusion a lot, right? It's like a it's a big project. Um we invested, I think Sam, you invested with me, right? In Cal.com, which is like the Cal Calendly, but open source. Uh, competitor because right. Calendly is like really expensive and the Cal.com guys have done a good job of, of building uh, the open source version of that. I really like this thesis. In fact, I think this OSS capital thing is really smart. Like there's a few like strategic venture fund ideas that I really liked. This is one of them. Um, another one that I had heard was somebody who's just taking pro ratas. So they're like, oh, you do all the work of finding the company uh, you know, 30% of them are going to die or whatever before they raise their next round. But the, of the ones that raise their next round, you have pro rata. You could top up and keep your percentage, but most investors don't want to do it or don't have the capital to do it. So these guys are just pro rata. And uh, that's pretty smart. I think there's a few like str like strategic venture funds. One I really wanted to do was just a flipper. So you basically, you would say, hey, I want to invest, but I'll be out when you raise your series A. I'm going to do, I'm really helpful in this zero to one, but as soon as you get to your series A, I'm out. Because a normal venture fund is like seven to 10 years and you're hoping for this like thousand X outcome, but the seed to series A valuation lift is like three X and it's usually in 12 to 18 months. And so if you could just pick well of like what seed startups are most likely to get to a series A, or you're just in an environment where a lot of companies are able to raise their next round, you can flip. And for the founder, it's great because you're like, cool, I could take this capital today, but it's actually non-dilutive. I'm like, they're going to be out by the next round and that same, those same shares go to the next investor. So it's actually less dilutive than normal capital. But wouldn't you be accused of uh, like a pump and dump? Well, you're not pumping it though. Like when somebody buys a home and and then sells it a year later, is that a pump and dump? Like, no. Like a, a, well, no, because the, like, well, I would argue a, a, a home has uh, like realized value, which is- But that's but, what happens but a series. A, from a seed startup when you invest or pre-seed startup, 18 months later, they've now built a product, they have customers, they have some traction, They their story is so much better, right? Like they are a de-risked startup in some way if they're able to raise. Theoretically, but not always. Usually. You're right, you're right, but but- the risk goes a little bit lower, um, and you you were in the you entered the riskiest stage at, at seed. The, the, so the problem is, it's just like a faux pas. Like uh, startup investing is supposed to be this like true believers. Uh, I I was in, and I'm here for the long haul, and like you're gonna change the world. Whereas when you sell at the Series A, you're like, oh, you might change the world, but. Probably not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all I know is you changed my bank account, you know, by three X <laughs> yeah. if I if I sold this right. And so I think that's the problem is it's so like it's an anti signal. 
Like nobody wants to see that your first investor wants out right away. It's a, such a bad signal. So you would have to first build your brand of this is what we do. It's not like for any company we do this, it doesn't mean anything about them. We do this with every company we invest in. And you'd have to frame it not as like a quick flip because that sounds like self-serving. You'd have to phrase it as like non-dilutive. It's like we're the early stage guys. We're really helpful early. We don't know anything after that. And like, we want you to not dilute yourself so much. So take our capital because we're going to basically give you back those shares to sell to the next guy rather than just t losing more and more equity as you go. Yes, still very, very high risk. <laughs> you have to be a very good picker and say, yes, this is going to go from C to A. But like I looked at my portfolio. So I looked at like 100 companies. I don't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head. But basically it was like out of 100 angel investments that I did. Uh, then I looked at what percentage of them raised the next round and what was the average multiple of the companies that raised the next round. You just multiply those together and it'll tell you like what's your expected value. And the, the math math when I did it last time, which was basically that enough companies raised the next round at enough of a multiple where you would be getting a, a good return. I think it was like 30%. I was the, I, the, the math was basically that I would be making 30% on my money, uh, which was fantastic and better than almost every venture fund out there. But I didn't, I didn't actually do that strategy because I thought of it later. And also, it's really hard to get around that perception problem. <laughs> <laughs> I thought of it when one of my yeah. pre companies raised a Series A and I was like, this company's not going to work. I wish I could just sell right now. And, uh, Bro, you know, <laughs> that's ex you're proving my point. You're, you're just proving my point. <laughs> Uh, What's Zion, the point? There's you, no point. No, that proves my point that you could, you could. Well, you're not strategy. pumping. You are dumping, though. Yeah, you're dumping. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's, what you should, that's what you should call it. Your dumping scheme. Speaking of numbers, I tweeted this out this morning. I want, I'm curious what you guys will guess. So I asked a question. Uh, I'll tell you, like, I guess I'll give you the background. So I was talking to, I heard this like coach, like an exec coach or whatever. And I was telling him, I was like, yeah, I'm trying to do, he's like, what are your goals for the year? So I was like, yeah, I'm trying to do this, this, and this. And one of the things I said, I was like, yeah, if I sell this business, I think I'll make, and I, I don't know what I said. I was like, I think I could make 20 million bucks. And I was like, and then, I was like, that'd be great because then, <laughs> then I paused. I was like, I was like, I don't actually, I have no idea what I have no idea what will change. And I was like, I was like, because no, it'll be cool because then I can, um, then my life will be better because I'll, uh, what will change? And I was like, wait, what am I doing? What is there any benefit to uh, incremental? And so I, I started thinking about this. I was like, I do want this. However, I do think it's a little silly that I can't point to maybe an area of life that I want to improve using the money. Money's a tool. I believe that, but I have no idea what I'm going to use this tool for. I'm just going to Home Depot trying to get a tool. And it's like, what, you, you, what do you need this drill for? And I'm like, I have no idea. So that was a little silly. So I tweeted out a question today. I said, how much money do you think you need to live your desired lifestyle? Because I think I'm very close to just living the exact desired lifestyle I have. I don't really have any more like desires of what I want to change. So what is money good for in that sense? And so I asked people, I said, zero to 1 million, one to 10 million, 10 to 50 or more than 50, 50 plus. And I said, how much money do you think you need in your bank account in order to be living your desired lifestyle? One of the answers got 47, 48%. Which one do you think it is, Saeed? And what's your answer? Yeah. Well, I think if, if, you're, if you're looking at between those four choices, most people probably said 10 to 50. That's what I would have guessed. Um, okay. That's what I would have said myself also. I think that's like the, like, kind of my, my nothing is per, not utopia where somebody's feeding me grapes and shit like that. But like, the, what I actually want, what I actually care about, I think is, is totally achievable in that range. So do you, uh, and so Sam's question was a good one. What, what would your answer be? Like, you've surpassed all these, great. What, what, but what yeah. do you think actually made a difference in your lifestyle where you're like, oh, I now have the money to live the lifestyle I want? I call it the threshold number. You know, I have a very simple life. <laughs> I don't I don't have these crazy desires of wearing the fanciest clothes or any of those things. Um, for me, it, the, the $10 million number was more than enough uh, to have a good life. Um, you know, I do what I do because I enjoy it. Uh, what would, uh, right. I want to be a productive member of society and this is fun for me. But, you know, people might say their number is uh, more. Do you think anything changes? Uh, like maybe like as you go as you go up, what gets unlocked at those levels of the game? The only ones I could think of, I'll just give you my answer. So I was like, I think if you go above 50 or go above 100, you know, private travel is like, you know, the big unlock where, you, you know, you don't have to think you just 
fly private everywhere, do do all that. I think that's the biggest one. And the second one is if if you really care about you being the one to give to charitable causes, I think that's the other thing that you could do is you could make large charitable donations. I don't really know what else gets unlocked past that, but you know, you might have other ideas. Am I missing anything? What gets unlocked over 50? Well, I think it's it's just the level of convenience uh, that you get, it, whether it is and whether it is through private travel, whether it is through um, private help at home, and, and so on, and then and the level of that that you can you know access just just get get elevated. Also, do you um, think there's a difference between fifty and five hundred? Like, is there like a number? where you think the level of convenience is mostly quite similar? Like, is it more convenient to have a significantly larger plane than a smaller private plane? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it makes a difference on how far you're trying to go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the poor like, rich guy yeah, in his small plane for, just puttering out and couldn't make it across the Atlantic. <laughs> just, just, I, I mean, yeah, yeah, like, you know, you can spend any amount of money that you want. If, if you have money, you can spend it. Like, do you really need it? I don't know. Um, and that's that based on each person. But even if you look at Taylor Swift, right? She had to take, she took a private jet, but it was not hers. Like she contracted a service to fly from Japan or wherever she was to Super Bowl because her own jet can't fly that far. Right. Um, now, does that mean that she she can't afford a bigger jet? No, I'm pretty sure she can. Um, but it just doesn't make financial sense for her to maybe have a global eight thousand or something like this. What was your number, Sean? Mine was in the 10 to 50. I thought 10 to 50, like that's, that is uh, past that. There's, there's very few things that are as appealing or just like big diminishing returns. But this is that my range perspective is too today. big. My, my number, my perspective 10 years ago would have been one to 10. Um, you know, I would have been like, oh, 10 past 10. What does it matter? And now past 10, you're like, eh, it kind of matters. And maybe that same thing happens again. I'm not sure. That's why I kind of like I say, you know, I want to ask other people's opinions. Um, because again, I think A, it doesn't get talked out, talked about much, uh, but clearly we're all acting on it. Everybody who's listening to this podcast, everybody on Twitter, you're all playing a money game and you're spending a huge portion of your life earning earning money. And it is probably worth knowing what's wor- uh, where does money really improve the quality of your life and what are those thresholds where and what are the things you can unlock? And so you could decide for yourself if it's really worth devoting this much energy and this much time to accumulating more. I yeah. think t- 10, 10 gives you a, a, a base. You've got your fortress of solitude. 10 is enough that you can tell most people to fuck off because you don't need much from anyone. Um, I actually still think you can lose 10 if you make a handful of bad investments. Um, uh, what, Syed, you're going to look at me stupid? because I <laughs> You can lose 100 uh, if you make a handful of bad yeah, investments. Yeah, there's no, no, no number you can't lose. <laughs> That's true. Um, and I think, I think a threshold is 10. I think another threshold is 50. That, that's my current thinking. What do you think happens at 50? What's the difference? I think at 50, you can fly private safely. Uh, like with that, like it's no big deal. You can fly private most every time you want. And, that, and that's the only difference? Um, well, you could have a, you know, at, with $10 million liquid, I wouldn't buy a $5 million house. A certain number, your nanny speaks Spanish. At a next number, she speaks English and Spanish. At the next number, she speaks English, Spanish, and French, right? That's what else changes. But like, Sean, where you, where you live, you live in one of the most expensive, like 50 mile radius parts of the world. Uh, like a, a really sick house is probably $6 million, right? Yeah. You're not going to buy that if you're worth 10, but you would buy that if you're worth 30, probably, right? Challenge accepted. So, <laughs> so don't like, tell me I won't some... do something. I will. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, no matter how big your house is, you can you will only ever be sitting in one seat at a time. So it's it's, it's important to have like perspective to not let the, the let the goalposts keep moving. You know, forward and then for what? Like, I mean, there, there's a house here that's 170 million dollar for sale. Like, you know, not too far away from so me. somebody who was <laughs> at the camp with us. I won't say their name, but they uh, they have a like a probably like. 15, $20 million home. And they called me yesterday and they were talking and they were like, oh, sorry, I've been on, like, I was, cause I called them. They were like, oh, sorry, I've been house hunting all day. Like, house hunting? You just bought like your dream home last year. And you told me like, we went crazy on this house because it's our dream home. And it's, it's, it's what we've been working for all these years. Why we, we made all this money. And then they were like, he's like, 
God, he's like, yeah, but he's like, our HVAC broke. And he's like, he's like, you know, that's 50, his 50 grand to fix that. He's like, my, the guy fixing our, fixing our AC, he's got like engineering degrees. I pay, pay two grand a month to our, our pool guy. Our pool guy's making two grand a month. He's like, and another four grand for landscaping. He's like, it's just annoying. He's like, everything that's, it's all my problem. He's like, he's like, yeah, it's great when we entertain people. But most of the time, I'm like you said, I'm just sitting in one chair. I'm sitting in the same chair and I have whatever, 10,000 extra square feet or 20,000 extra square feet of like empty house. And so and it was just like such a visceral reminder of the like the age old wisdom of like first you own your things and then they own you. And it was like he was just explaining all the ways that his thing now owned him. And he had this like reaction where he's like, I got to change this because like this is not my dream. Actually, I thought this was my dream. It is not my dream, actually, because I don't want to be owned by this where now my monthly nut is so high. I have to stress about, you know, about all these things or when things break, it's such a colossal break. I feel so wasteful, you know, that I'm spending this much just fixing our whatever pool or whatever it is when in reality that money could like, I remember what that money could do for me. I used to live a whole year off that money and now it's just, you know, going to, to one little thing. Um, How many square feet was this place? Uh, I don't know. It's probably like 15,000 square feet or something like that. That's uh, fucking insane. <laughs> that is so insane. Is it 15,000 like, yes, people? It's more than 10, uh, less than 20, I think. Dude, that's but, like, you, know, you, you need, that's a commercial property, basically. You need like a property <laughs> manager. That's insane. I, I think it's important. It, one of the things that a lot of people don't think about is the holding cost of anything that you're, that you're acquiring, uh, whether it's a property or a business or what, you know, understanding the holding cost, the real holding cost uh, may help you not make certain decisions. There's other there's them. other hidden costs too, right? Holding cost is one. Opportunity cost is another that people usually discount. There's a great tweet that was going viral. I don't know if you saw it yesterday, but the guy said, he goes, he goes, I think making between 150 and 250K is the worst. <laughs> it's like, what? He's like, is he's like, it's the worst because it's too much money to just say, fuck it, I'm just going to go do this thing I really want. So it's like too much money to walk away from, but it's not enough to ever like, actually get escape velocity financially because you're paying like a huge amount of taxes and then you probably live in a, your lifestyle creeps up. And so, and I, and I saw, like, I see this so often, which is that there's some range. I don't know what the, the, the numbers depend on where you live and what industry you're in, but something like 200 grand to 500 grand is like, the, it's, that's the real golden handcuffs. And that's the real like danger zone. That doesn't sound like a danger zone. It's a hit, but it's a hidden danger usually. Cause if you're making that much, you're probably very talented. However, it is so hard to walk away from that amount of money if you, once you get to that and take a risk, maybe start a business or take another job that might give you all kinds of other things, but maybe have less certainty or less annual guaranteed pay. Um, and I could see that tweet going viral because I think it resonated with so many people. The guy had like no followers, but the tweet had like 20,000 likes. You know, uh, I mean, it also depends on your personality. My uncle who moved to U.S. 40 years ago, he's a teacher. Um, and you know, teachers in America don't make a lot of money, but he's still retired a millionaire. So I think it's all about how you invest that and yeah, I, compounding. I think that tweet is really fucking stupid. Um, why do you I, think that? <laughs> I think that if you make $250,000 a year, you can live a very rich life. Um, I think that you could have a beautiful, rich life. I think you can retire by a certain age. I think, I think that that is an out of touch tweet. I think that tweet is true. If your goal is to make tens of millions of dollars or be your own boss at, at a young yeah, I think, age. I think it's I think it's true for the people it's true for, right? Which is if you want to be an entrepreneur or you want to yes. uh, be financially free and not have to trade your time for for a salary, right? If, no, you can be financially free on 250 a year. If you, when you, you're if 60. You, and uh, I don't this know. Guy's you, Cal- right? this is, I, I live in California. I'm using California as my frame of reference here. Then right? Yeah. The, where you live definitely changes <laughs> things and what your burn is. But New you York, could... California, like a lot of places like stuff. I don't know. Like what's the amount of money you need, even if you're living in Texas? Like, what do you think is the r- real amount of money? You make 250 a year and then you have taxes. So you're taking home. I don't know what the math is, but like something like 175 or 180, something like that. And then you pay for life. And you might be stashing away 100K a year. How many years do you have to stash away 100K in order to like be financially be, be financially free? It takes a, a decade plus. Yeah, a decade. Well, at a least, decade. right? And, and even to get to 250, that takes you usually seven to 10 years to get to making that much, right? Seven years to get to that, that salary threshold too, right? So now you're 17 to 20 years in. That's a lot. That's a long time. Side, what are you going to say? I, you don't like what Sean's saying right now. I can tell. <laughs> I think it's 
there there's certain something about the guaranteed payment and it really depends on your personality like the folks that are going to become an entrepreneur they don't need to walk away from 250 a lot of times like i mean when i started i had nothing <laughs> no salary right um so a lot of folks start out and they don't have a salary and they they just kind of go and pursue it if you if that's what you want to do you go do it you have, you have to have conviction and i think that's that's key to the success anyways um, especially as an I'll entrepreneur. I'll clarify one thing. I'm not giving advice to other people for what they should do or what the average right. person should do. I'm saying from my perspective of what I would want in my life, which is the only thing I can really speak on is the things that I know about myself. Right. And I know that most of the people who listen to this podcast are going to be people who are like-minded. Otherwise, how did you get to episode 500 if you weren't into entrepreneurship or you weren't like-minded in, in, in some way with, with our ethos? And for people in our world, I think then it's a valuable message, right? Like, um, I, I think there's a lot, I know a lot, I have a lot of friends personally who are in this situation. I know what they actually want out of life. I know where they where they live and the lifestyle they desire. And for them, that is a, a very dangerous thing. Of course, to an, if I'm just speaking generically, that advice totally doesn't apply. It's totally out of touch and it's, it's a total overkill. I get that. I think that's fair. I, I, I wanted to give you an alley. I wanted to give you an alley oop. It's like I shot um, myself in the foot and then I put a band-aid on it at the very end. So it's all good. <laughs> uh, where do we want to go from here? Let's do a couple other ones that you have on this doc. So you have, um, let's go to the bottom here with the, the strong, <clears throat> strong opinions or philosophies. And so you talked about acquiring a business versus paid marketing. I think this is kind of interesting. I think most people don't really think about this. I know when I was running my company, I never thought like, hey, let me grow through acquisition. That wasn't, so it wasn't on my radar. Uh, what's your point here? What do you what do you what do you think is the, the takeaway? I think uh, when when you think about growing a subscription business, there's only three ways to grow it. You get new customers, you expand the existing customers, you reduce churn. And in the new customer bucket, most of the people are always looking at um, PPC, and especially at a certain scale, you might be spending a lot of money in PPC, pay per click, pay per click, exactly, pay per click advertising, um, and your CAC might be high, especially in a very very competitive market. Um, in that sense, it makes sense to just go pay a uh, revenue multiplier to buy a business that has the customers that you that you're targeting anyways, and then cross sell. Um, and I would say that that's that's something that more CEOs need to think about um, when they're thinking about growth. You know who knows about this? Your boy. I sold the hustle to HubSpot because I actually didn't know about this. They knew about it. And they made, about? they made the right. I know about it in that I know a guy. I, I know a guy. No, I know a guy who did this and they bought my business. That was the whole point of right. HubSpot. That was the whole point of this podcast. Now, I don't have too much information. I haven't been part of it in forever, but I think it's working. So are you talking about buying other like products or like content sites? Anything and everything. I, I was looking at this publicly traded company um, and where I was looking to potentially establish a sizable stake. And their revenues were growing steadily, but not exponentially because they couldn't compete with the larger competitors. Um, but the reseller side of their business was great. I, one of their resellers were actually making more money than this company was. What's a reseller? Like, Can, can you give an example that isn't related to this company? Sure. So like I could, for example, resell uh, HubSpot or any any other, you know, hosting, I can be a hosting reseller. Um, I can make my own hosting company selling Amazon. I can be Amazon reseller and so on. Um, and so, so for this business, they basically just uh, acquired one of their resellers and boosted the revenue. <laughs> so it's just like the same customer that they had that the re and bringing it in. I wanted to work with the management and just kind of fund the acquisition of the reseller because the margins, if, if it was in-house, would be much, much better. How can a reseller make more than the main thing if you're just reselling and then presumably giving a cut back to the to mothership? How does the reseller ever make more money? No, it, it's a, it all depends on the pricing and how you're licensing and what you're charging on, on your end. Okay. Um, so like, uh, let's say if we, we both could be drop shipping the same thing and I could charge like five times premium because I know how to market better and gotcha. you're charging only 2x. Okay. Right? So... But but that's just one example that you can you can look into your own ecosystem and start acquiring your resellers and, and bring that customer in house. But also, what HubSpot did with the content site makes total sense. What um was Zendesk just recently did um, with Klaus uh, makes total sense, um, and and so on. So, I think that when when you're looking at you know 
acquisition and, and growth. Like, in a, I'm talking about acquisition from like new customer acquisition. Think about M and A as a uh, as a viable option, uh, especially when your PPC budget is is high. Could your WordPress empire have existed without you owning WP Beginner? So WP Beginner for the listeners, by the way, it's like a blog. If you Google how to set up an email service on WordPress. WP Beginner, which Syed owns, always shows up number one. So would your empire have existed without WP Beginner? Well, no, the answer is no, but for many reasons, no. <laughs> I think you can't build solutions to solve problems that you don't fully understand. And for me to be able to build the best solution in the market, I had to communicate with the audience. I had to understand their pain points. Um, and that, I believe, was our biggest advantage. Of course, the marketing and having the audience is very important too. Uh, very, very important. But um, I think that understanding of the pain point is crucial. Like, for example, uh, in talking to their customers and also our, my various company founders and uh, GMs, I realized that uh, we were not happy with our help desk software. So we went and, and acquired a uh, stake in Groove, right, which is a help desk software that will uh, drastically reduce cost for anybody who's using Zendesk or anybody using HelpScout. But now I know that like certain customers that are that are using Groove may also want our other solutions, and I know that many of our customers and agencies and so on they're all using a help you know a help desk software. So I can uh, you know cross promote Groove to them and say, hey, if you switch from uh, Zendesk or whatever, you'll save forty percent. If you if you're an agency you're using Front for your communication, switch here and you'll save eighty percent. So that level of synergy. Um, gets unlocked um, and can be quite lucrative. Can we finish with these two like life uh, life lesson type things? I think they're both good. I know, I know we're on time, but I, I want to do it anyways. Compounding goodwill is the best form of compounding. What do you mean by that? I think uh, too many times we are very transactional in the relationships that we're in. Um, it's, you know, we're give, doing something nice and saying, hey, do something back in return for me. I think just giving um, with no expectation return. A lot of us are very smart. Uh, and sometimes in that we can be kind of, you know, a holy, <laughs> you know, and, and, and not so nice. So I think intellect is a gift and kindness is a choice. And if, if we choose to be kind um, over long term, this this comes back multi, multi, multi folds. So not letting your uh, ego or the keyboard warrior get to you and, and you know, say, I'm smarter than you. You're 100% wrong. Uh, just just w w go, going along and even, trying to help out wherever you can. Even if you feel like you're in the right, sometimes it's better to just be kind anyways. Um, yes. You know, sometimes I, I get stuck on that where I'm like, this is, but this is right. That's what we said. And actually, it doesn't matter what we said. I should just, in that moment, it's it matters more to them than it does to me to just let it, to just be kind and just go their way rather than, than mine. I've learned that lesson the hard way a couple of times. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. You wrote this guy's name, Guy Spear. I've seen this guy around, but I don't know him. Who is this guy? He's got something special. He hosts some conference thing, right, that people really like. Who is this guy? Yeah. Why is he the example of that? Yeah, so he, he's a really good friend now, um, and we're in a forum together. So he, his conference is called Value X. Very well-known value investor. Um, has a book as well. And, you know, he talks about compounding goodwill. Um in his book, uh, an intelligent investor, uh, educational value investor, actually. Um, and I'm always really, really amazed by his level of generosity. The amount of like, hey, you need this, let me just connect you with X and Y and Z. And long term, what he's been able to do is build this amazing network of super duper talented people that like, you know, if he rings, they'll pick up and you know, help out, whatever, and nothing, nothing in, in return. So I think he is an amazing example, and uh, I learned a ton from him. Even you know, we were in Chicago a couple months ago, and he gave me an idea to acquire, like a, a very cool deal idea um, of acqu doing acquisitions. And then, lo long story short, I was able to actually use it. <laughs> a deal came, and I <laughs> used that exact tactic to make a make a purchase in a very tax efficient way. So I think his ability to just you know do that is really good, but. I, you know, I don't know you that well. We're, we're friends, but we don't hang out too much. If I had to guess, I would say that you're a very shrewd negotiator. And I would say that you're probably a very disciplined and firm manager. I think you're probably quite nice, but I think that like 
you're a very disciplined person, which sometimes people would say, well, you're just being an asshole or something like that. You know, if you have enough employees, some of them are going to think that about you. How are you balancing being a nice person and also like trying to get the best of a deal or uh, trying to capture uh, a little bit more value for yourself than for the other person? I think not all juice has to be squeezed if you think about value on a very long term way. So part of the discipline is to say, okay, well, we don't have to squeeze all the juice today. <laughs> you know, you, you, that, that's the whole point about compounding goodwill. You know, if, if I acquire something from a founder um, and let go of a few percentages because that helps me have a great long-term relationship with this person, um, that's a worthwhile decision. Rather than saying, you know what, you're down and I'm going to, like you know, kind of crush you, and that that that's not good for reputation long term. But do you Anyways, go into do you go into a negotiation saying, "Here's my threshold of I can no longer do the, or I won't do it at this number, but I will do it anything below this," and then you go with like a number and you leave room for that negotiation or for that threshold, and then you just don't ever cross that particular <laughs> number, like. Uh, you're talking about uh, no, goodwill, and of you're course. like super calculating about it. You're like, well, like a negotiation, <laughs> like a trick. Well, because I know, that, I know that he's a value investor, and a value investor, they like at some point, they're like, you, you make money on the buy. You make money when you buy something at a low price, and so like there has to be like a threshold of like it doesn't make yeah. sense after this, and so I just can't indeed, be a nice indeed. guy anymore. Just because you're winning, it doesn't mean the other person has to lose, and I think that's a very important uh, aspect of compounding goodwill. You know, that, that's also the example of like, you know, just because, you know, you're very smart, you don't have to prove the other person wrong. You can, you can agree to disagree or move on and just saying, okay, you know, this is fine. Maybe it's worthwhile considering this and, you know, letting that conversation be in and in, in, in going away. But of course, in business, you have to be very, very disciplined, if, especially as a capital allocator. Um, and that's, that, that's that. Let me tell you guys a quick story as we wrap up here. Uh, that was like the best good guy story that I heard. I, I heard it on another podcast, but apparently... Adam Sandler. Adam Sandler was uh, in New York. He was taking acting class classes, and the uh, the teacher was like, "Hey, I want to take you out for a beer. Let's talk." So the teacher takes him out, and he goes, "Look, Adam, you don't have what it takes, and I just want you to quit doing it now because I don't want you to waste two decades, and it's just not going to go your way. I want to show you love and respect by telling you now." Obviously, ten years pass. Adam Sandler's still doing this. He's an epic star. Uh, he's at the top of his game. He's at a bar in New York. He's with his friends. He's with his buddies. He sees that professor, that teacher out. And he's. And I imagine in his head, he's thinking like, well, should I go rub it in this guy's face? And be like, told you, I win. He walks over to the guy and he uh, brings his buddies with him. And Adam looks at his buddies. He goes, hey, I want to meet you. I want you guys to meet Professor Blankety Blank. They were the only professor that was kind enough to take me out and buy me a beer. And I heard <laughs> that story and I was like, that is one of the best stories I've ever heard about treating people respectfully, even yeah. though, you know, you may be a little bit angry or you didn't like them at the time. But Sean, did you, you saw that I clip? saw that clip. I love that story. Uh, it's Brad Pitt telling the story, by the way, which just makes it even better. Uh, you did good. But Brad Pitt telling the story was a little bit better, I think. Just <laughs> Hey, no, I saw Andrew Santino say it. Oh, okay. Maybe it was somebody else. Um, I think Sam did an excellent job. Yeah. <laughs> You're my Brad Pitt, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> both both, both uh, hot guys from Missouri. I'll take it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Syed, thank you very much. That's the pod. Thank you.